Welcome to the Julia and Gino podcast, where business meets family. We explore what the entrepreneurial life looks like from a family perspective. We are your hosts, Julia and Gino Barbaro. Hey everyone, this is Julia Barbaro, host of the Julia and Gino podcast. I'm here with the co-founder of Jake and Gino, my husband and co-host, Gino Barbaro. Miss Julia. Yes. How are we doing today? I'm awesome. You, you like how I look? I love it. I dressed up just Thank for you. you. Yeah. He really just got a new suit. <laughs> so he had to wear it, try it out. The girls like just flaunted all over him this morning, you know. That's right. Isn't yeah, it good? That's they love it. And yeah. this show is about fatherhood. Exactly. So we're gonna be talking about fatherhood and storytelling. And he's a repeat guest. Today we're honored to share with us America's number one ghostwriter, the legendary Dennis Ross. I, whoever wrote this is really spot on with this intro. Dennis is the founder of Book Ambition that ghostwrites bestsellers for thought leaders around the globe, and he's the proprietor and teacher of the Ross Story Method that's utilized by Fortune 500 companies and private clients around the world. Welcome back to the show, Dennis. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you so kindly. Thank you for having me again. This is beautiful. Dennis, I don't even know where to start. I think the first thing we should start out with is if you want to just even share your story of how you got into writing, and then from there, pivot into what your company does. But before you do that, beautiful burden. I call Jake my beautiful burden. This is my beautiful burden right here. This is my wife. She truly is beautiful. I'm more like the burden, but I'm just going to- That's why you're her. so successful. Let's just be honest. I love it. Well, it's great to be here. I, again, am the founder of bookambition.com. We are a story design firm and we do three things. We work with authors. We actually form their manuscripts, write their books, uh, in, in our absence, you don't see our names, you see theirs. And we also work with startups, largely in Silicon Valley, designing their story. We call it narrative engineering. We actually design the story they use to go raise money for their cap raise. And thirdly, we work with enterprises, with corporations, established companies that need a fresh, innovative way to tell a new story about an old product most of the times uh, to sell their products and services to the public. And so we come in and create the story that connects the heart of the company to the heart of their consumer, such that they have an emotive connection, just not a connection of commerce. And so that is somewhat of a, a summary of, of what we do is as a story design firm, uh, there are very few, if any of us in the country, uh, most people understand story, they understand how powerful it is, but we actually specialize in designing it for your particular product or service or book. And no, so I that's a little bit about what we do. I promise the listeners we're going to get into this podcast talking about family and talking about fatherhood because that's really, I, I think, what, where our passions lie. But before we do that, there's a couple of questions that I really want to discuss about the seven stages of a story. I know in, in our other podcast, so many of our students got so much value from it. So just in case they didn't hear that here, but also you had shared with me before you got on, why is it important for someone like Gino to hire someone like Dennis, even though I know my own story, I know what happened. I sucked at the restaurant. I hated it. It was soul sucking. But why do I need to hire Dennis to pull that story out of me? It's very good. And so most individuals understand their story because they lived it and they tell it and people are impressed by it. But if you're going to reach the masses who have not a love or a like for you, they don't know you. They didn't grow up with you. So they won't make the concessions uh, to basically fill in all the gaps. They just like you. But when you're going into the marketplace with a story, you must have more than just the knowledge of the story. You must have story craft. You must understand how to build it. It is the difference, as I said earlier, between I understand a dream home. I know what it looks like in my mind, how I want it to look, but that's not enough. I must go, go and hire a builder who has the craft an architect to actually lay it out in the form a builder can actually read. And so it's important for a person like you to go beyond vision, to go beyond internal knowledge of your story and engage someone like myself, a firm like myself, who has the craft of story, understanding how to put it together sequentially, understanding how, how to use the economy of expression, which is how to say more in less time, understanding pairing the unpaired, understanding emotional misdirection, emotional redirection, all of these elements are craft. And so it's, it's your emotions of your story must be paired with some analytics of story design if you're going to reach the peak of story effectiveness in the marketplace. Wow, I love that answer. And when we had discussed the seven stages of a story, I'm going to warn everybody, Dennis is gonna go through them again. I want you to really pay attention because I created the last two presentations from these seven stages and it was mind numbingly easy. And yet 
empowering. And I was able to go through the belief all the way through the inspiration. And it really led me to actually create my PowerPoint slides powerfully concise. And I really shared the story. So would you mind just going through the seven stages really quickly and then promise to dive into fatherhood? Yes, yes, I will. And so I created over the years from 10,000 hours more than 10,000 hours of interview time with individuals who have disjointed pieces of their story and how to put it all together in some type of lucid form. I created something called the Raw Story Path, RSP. Many people call it the Raw Story Method. And it is seven steps of how to take your story and go from one to seven, seven being inspiration. Number one, step one is belief. Who taught you what to believe? Who told you what to believe? Who poured concrete over your moral constitution as a child that lets you know what matters and what matters most? Who was that person? What is their name? What is that group? What is that church body? What is that community that shaped and molded you and gave you your belief system from which it is very difficult to remove yourself no matter how old you get? Step number two is trigger event. We leave from belief to trigger event. That is, what is that one thing? Many people say a lot of things in my life changed my life. That may be true, but there was one thing that is supreme above them all. What is the one event without which it happening, your life would be going in a different direction? Could be a birth of a child, could be a loss of a, lo loss of a loved one, could be a marriage, a divorce, a molestation, a dysfunction, a foreclosure, a loss of job. All of these life's events, what is that one thing? And that takes time to really dither down into being honest with yourself to say, a lot of things mattered in my life, but this thing mattered most. That is the trigger event. Step three is conflict of belief. This is when you get to a place in your life where you've been taught what to believe, but now you're seeing something that contradicts that. You're having a, a conflict of belief which generally comes out of a conflict of exposure. You've gone places, done things, met people that those in stage one as a child, your aunts, your uncles, your parents who love you, they have never been exposed to that. So in step three, you are forced to make peace with what you were taught as your belief system and what you're experiencing in your life. You are taught, as I teach in my class, at this stage, you learn how to separate good people from bad information. That's the conflict of belief. And then we go to step four, which is adaptation. For many years, we rode down the highways at 75 miles an hour with no seatbelt on because there was no seatbelt law. But then the law changed and we had to adjust to a new, new reality. We had to adapt to a new reality that now I'm required to do this. That's step four, accepting a new reality. Step five is adjustment. Now that I have accepted there's a seatbelt law, I must become comfortable and living each day, putting this thing across my chest. So adaptation is the intellectual acceptance of a new reality. Adjustment is the physical modification so you can live with the new reality. Step six is transformation. You become a different person when you have been introduced to a new reality, when you've made adjustments for a new reality, when you've had a conflict of belief of what you were told really matters in life, finding out there's, you weren't told some things, you've gone through this trigger event, so that takes you to a transformation where you become a different person. You've reconciled these things. You've separated good people from bad information, which takes us to step seven. I'm going through this quickly. Obviously there's a lot more pieces, more nuances. Step seven is when you tell this pathway, this story, you become an inspiration. What most people don't know is synonymous with inspiration is efficiency because when you are inspired, you are able to access the wisdom from another person's journey without having to traverse the same path. Inspiration allows me to learn what Gino and Jake and Gino learned over 30 years without having to live 30 years to, to actually do it. So inspiration is actually efficiency. It, efficiency is the most positive consequence be, from becoming inspired, from learning your belief system, from experiencing your trigger event, from watching your conflict and belief and how you made peace with the contradictory elements of life, adapting to a new reality, adjusting to a new reality, transforming into who Jake and Gino are today now inspires me when I see their show. I don't have to find out all the pain it took to have this show. I can see your show and be inspired to start mine by picking up all the wisdom without having to go through the pain it took to learn it. So that is the story path, the raw story path I take my clients through 
whether it be their personal story, their professional story, that allows us to go from the fundamental elements of who they are and why they are to who they are and why they are today, which is the last step of inspiration, which allows a reader and a viewer to be efficient and to get to where they're going quicker and to give you the thanks and the appreciation for being honest with your story that saved them years of time. I'm going to try to transition into what the podcast was about, well, which is fatherhood, but quick, wow, that, that was, was awesome. So amazing. I have to say, Dennis, in those seven things that you just talked about, I think I learned more in those three minutes <laughs> than, than all many books that I read about storage. <laughs> so that was very impressive. I'm like ready to sign up for, to write a book. <laughs> now, now I'm giving more work we, to my husband. And, and do that point to that to that point we do teach a class called how to build a story each year and at the somewhere when you allow me i'll give you information of how someone can actually take the class online it is a virtual class in which we go through a three-day cohort going through this in great detail you learn how to build a story in in, in very specific terms and that's on your website how would how do people find uh, that? that's that is not on our website we actually i think i forwarded you the the um the link but I'll, I'll send that to you out and if you want more information you can send me an email it's a private class so we don't mm -hmm. advertise it publicly so it's by invite only info mm -hmm. at bookambition.com info at bookambition.com and i'll send you information about how to sign up for our december course let's get let's get back to business i'm because I'm, I'm, I'm really good at spending my husband's <laughs> money that's why he's getting a little <laughs> every money. time okay. i hear i've got an idea <laughs> My partner says, hey, babe. She says, I was thinking. So she already seen the wheels spinning and it's a good thing. We're investing in our education. So it's not an expense. I, I have my mother-in-law in the back of my head telling me, Julia, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. Everything I do, she's like, what are you? Why did you did you not have anything to do? <laughs> like, why'd you write it? You don't need it. So here we go again. Dennis, fatherhood. What what why are you so passionate about fatherhood? And maybe you should share that question that you ask every single one of the people that you interview for your book. That to me blew my mind. That's why I've, I've got to get Dennis back on talking about fatherhood. Yes, fatherhood is is so important and it has become more important over the years as I've interviewed many authors for their books. Uh, I was speaking to you about how this sort of piqued in my interest because as I write individuals books, I ask a question on the first day we get together. Now we're gonna meet for six, seven months, but in, within the first few minutes, I, I say this. I say, imagine this is our last session and we've had a great time. It's been wonderful working with you. I'm very glad we have come up with a great manuscript. I say, there's just one page I need to finish and the book will be done. And it is the acknowledgements page. And then I ask this question, what do you want me to say to your father? And that question is always followed in sequence with what I'm about to do without deviation after almost 20 years of writing books, every person, white, black, Jew, Gentile, Catholic, atheist, black, white, did I say that already? <laughs> Anyone yeah. on earth, they all do this. I need a moment. And that is followed with silence that's followed with, I need to think about this. Mm -hmm. I need to get back to you. Now, what is so interesting, because we're all human, what is so interesting is when I ask them about their mother, they have an immediate answer. Oh, she's been a great support. I love her. She was always there for me. I can talk to her. I can tell her anything, any day and hour. She's, she's always been there. She's always believed in me. It is benevolent. It is emotional. It is it's a wonderful response and they love their mother dearly, but the father question creates consternation, creates whether, and, and let me be clear, whether their father's child relationship is intact, whether they've never met their father, whether they love their father beyond words, it does not matter the level, the quality of the relationship it is the relationship itself that sends the poor, the wealthy, no matter what their social economic status in life. I have been fascinated that I have always received the same response. Even up until three days ago, I was speaking with the son of an author that I was working with. He was in, he's in Germany and I'm here. And I asked that same question 
And I was just looking for him to break the sequence, break the mold. And he's all the way in Germany, German speaking young man. He's 27 years old. I said, what do you want me to say to your father? And I said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. He went to silence. He said, <sighs> I said, what is this about fatherhood? The people get, their throat gets. So that has sent me on, aside from my personal experiences as being a father, that has sent me on a journey to understand what is this thing about our fathers that reaches a deeper, different, deeper place than with our mothers. And so without going much further, that has, that has arrested me and has caused me to dig deeper into what is it that makes fatherhood so important? Well, let me answer this question. I mean, what do you think makes it makes fatherhood important? You know, my, my personal, and this, much of this is, is anecdotal, mm -hmm. but I believe that a child, whether they are male or female, gains a certain amount of human worthiness, which is separate from, I feel loved. A, a certain amount of dignity comes from the strength of how their father feels about them. We live in a in a dangerous world. We live in a world that um, requires someone to look out for you. And while I believe I wouldn't, I would, you know, give anything from my mother and my father. And I, I, I love my mother beyond words. You understand that. But there's something about the relationship with the father that I can survive in this dangerous place called the world. Mm -hmm. There's something that the mother cannot provide that I think even when we don't know our fathers, for, I'm blessed to, to have an, an unbelievable father, but some people do not have, know their fathers. And even in the absence of knowing him, it still creates that same response. So I believe that fatherhood gives us a certain worthiness, a certain protective quality that allows us to have the strength, even the dignity, the courage to walk out of our front door into the world each day, knowing that our father loves us not that our mother loves us, but knowing that our father loves us and even more that he would do anything to protect us. That's how I've processed it. That's how I've processed it. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent. I, I, you know, as you know, obviously a, a female, I can tell you on the other side that I do you, you look at and I, we have five daughters. So, you know, and I see what they look at my husband is, is a protector, you know, and and it and it. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, your your husband is is six five and you know gigantic. It's it's the protector feeling. It doesn't matter what size they are. What does it matter at all? It's it's the feeling of they're going to protect me. You know, you think of a baby being protected by the father. It's just it's a beautiful image. Um, and and when we look at our fathers, you know, we think we 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 want a couple of things, and we 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 see a couple of things. I should say that unconditional love that doesn't have to be used with words. And I wonder if the word part is hard with moms, you know, I could talk to my kids, they can talk back to me, but with fathers, it's the wording is a little different. You know, I always say my husband's the head of the house and he, you know, he's very, he uses his mind to, to fix things. He, he thinks yes. about things and we mm -hmm. use our intuition, the moms, mm -hmm. we use the heart. And I think that's something to do with it where when we're trying to explain fatherhood, it's harder. And yes. so we don't have the words for it. But we it's just so, want a protector. We want to protect, but we also want the gentleness of a father. Yes. I mean, I, I'm just, you're saying, I can't add in, anything to it. I think fatherhood is atmospheric. Mm -hmm. Fatherhood is, it's not literal strength. I mean, right. some of the strongest men I know are actually physically tiny men who, mm -hmm. you know, you just feel like you need to lower in their presence because mm -hmm. of the respect they garner, right. because of how they live their life. Mm -hmm. And, and so it is, um, it is a difficult place. Even someone like myself who has a great relationship with my father, it's even hard as a person who writes stories for a living. It's even difficult for me to place words into wordless places, mm -hmm. such as what does fatherhood really mean? Because it exists tangibly, but it really exists, exists in greater degree intangibly. You just know when it's not there, you know when it's there. But the crazy thing is, 
when it's not there, it's still there. Yeah. And so it is, it, it is, it's very, it's very, very interesting. Um, and, and I love what, what you said. Uh, you, you said he was, the, you know, this may be a traditional <laughs> view, but I'm right there with you. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm right there with you and I make no apologies for it. I, I believe that, you know, when things are in order in the correct sequence, magic, beautiful things happen. Yeah. And um, I, I believe when we as men take our right place, because we have we have a lot of responsibility to do that, and we're and when we're honored for the right place we're in, I think that uh, the family works best. I, I think you just hit on something is that you know especially in Hollywood I guess society is is they're trying to bring the man down and their role as father in the house, and it's so important to know you know I grew up single mother, you know I we did, we knew our father we we, we saw him but it is missing. And I think a lot of people think, well, you don't really need the, the husband in the home anymore. You don't really need a father at home. He can be replaced. And I think that is so dangerous because we could <sighs> never ever replace the man in the house. We can never replace the father. You know, my mom did a great job loving us and do caring and doing all of that, but she could never take on a role that she can't be. And, yes. and I think that's important that people know that and understand that the role of father in, in, in the family is, is, I mean, it's, it's everything. It's and everything. And just as I, I have two boys, I don't, I don't have a daughter. Um, and I, I think God knew what he was doing. Because <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not sure I what mean, that means. Cause this guy has five girls. So. <laughs> yeah. You can't be even, worse than me is what she's saying. All right. So <laughs> I don't know. Even when I think about if I, I, when I think about if I had a daughter in theory, I get upset in theory. I get upset. <laughs> I, I don't even, I'm thinking about what I was like, oh, no one better not knock on my door. And I'm like, but I don't have a daughter. I mean, it's just crazy. So <laughs> you'll have many granddaughters. <laughs> right, right, right. Like. Exactly. Oh, I'm a big mess. Oh, oh my goodness. So um, I, I agree with every word you said. Uh, I believe that it is impossible mm -hmm. for a man to teach a young girl how to be a woman. Right. It's, it's literally impossible. Uh, it's impossible for a woman to teach a young boy how to be a man. It's literally impossible. Now, thankfully, God in his infinite wisdom, who is rich in mercy, has given each of us enough to get by if by no fault of our own, the father passes, the mother passes, things happen in life. Yeah. And so we have enough love in us to to give what we can so that the person does not grow up totally without, uh, without having what they need. Uh, but it is definitely shoving a, a, a circle into a square shape mm -hmm. when you do that. Um, but I respect those who were forced to do it. But I, I, I just agree with everything you said. I believe once the fathers take their rightful place in the lives of our children, mm -hmm. our children will become better adults who will then have become better parents and be, it's just a circle that goes around and around. But I, but I also give respect and honor to those who were forced to take roles they are not designed to and did the best they could. And so I, I never want to dis disrespect uh, those individuals. Well, I think you, I mean, obviously that's true. And, and there's so many people, for instance, my mother who did the best she could at the time. And, you know, but it's, it's good to remember too, just even we're here, both of us, you know, you and we're here with raising our children, doing the best we can as my mother, as the father. And there's only so much we could do for our kids. There's only so much we can love them and do the right things. And at that point, you have to just let go and let God take care of the rest to be the true yes. father, because what else we can only do, we can only give so much. Right. Human. It's <laughs> it is. And, and it is interesting when we, you know, I, I being a believer and making the assumption you all are too, what is, what is interesting is when you think about fatherhood, it, you can't really figure it out until you really think about it because yeah. our faith informs our fatherhood. I mean, we're taught as children how to pray our father. That's how we pray. <laughs> our father, which right. are in heaven, <laughs> hallowed be thy name, That's thy right. kingdom come. So even when you think about it, you know, when you think about the story, for those of us who have a biblical worldview, for those of us, and I respect those who do not, but I do, and for those who have a biblical worldview, uh, we understand how fatherhood has gained such momentum because even in scripture, when you study the life of Christ, he always says, I don't do my will, I do what my father tells me to do. 
And so father is always the lead in everything. Yes, 100%. So my wife is always criticizing me for wanting the solutions or having the solution. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is your own belief or what you believe in. Give me an idea of how to become a better father. What does Gino need to do in your estimation, or in your mind of trying to become a better father? Wow. That is a heavy question. <laughs> I'm a heavy dude. It's, if you don't know by now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're going to make me do what I do when I ask the other people. <laughs> it's like, that, is, that is a heavy question. You know, I, I would say, and I'm not going to just segregate this to you because I'm going to include myself because I have a lot of growing to do. I think adaptability, uh, being able to, having the flexibility, the malleability to hold on to principles that are true, but to apply them in new innovative ways, I think is the thing that I've been trying to do. How do I teach my children the fundamental principles of, of discipline, ethics, morality, while also acknowledging they live in a different world and to package it not in such a dogmatic way that they would resist it before they learn the wisdom of it and to present it in a way that is palatable to the young mind today, the digital native, the child who's never grown up in a world that did not have a cell phone, the child who believes, who's never heard of ABC, but has heard of Netflix. And so, the, so, I, you know, for me, the advice I would give to you would be the same I give to myself. Work on my story, <laughs> work on my approach so that I'm still able to give the principle uh, in, in a new way, but it still has the old effect of, of their learning what I want them to learn. And that's something I have struggled with being relevant to my, my sons such that they would, uh, relevant enough to, so that they would listen to something I'm saying, but not really knowing I'm saying something that is two, three, 400 years old. And they're thinking that, oh, this is new. I, I like this, I like this mm -hmm. whole thing. So that's something I would do. And, and maybe secondly, what I need to do more, and, I'm, and I would present this to you is, I, I've, I have sort of self-critiqued. And I, I think I talk too much and I think I need to listen more to my children and process before I answer. Uh, my father is great with that. That's something he doesn't need to get better at. My father gives advice very infrequently, but by the time he gives you a piece of advice, you can take it to the bank. He may have thought about it for five years. He's a thinker. And so I want some of that to talk less, listen more, and to find new ways to teach old principles. Do you mind if I add a couple of thoughts to, to your uh, to your answer? Please do. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I can't be as eloquent as you. Dogmatic, uh, palpable, those words are way over my head. And, and the second thing, I'm a great listener, aren't I, baby? I don't need to work on that at all. Never. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's like my Achilles heel. Say, oh, you're, yeah, you're let me finish myself <laughs> over here. I, I would add some of the skills you need to be as a father is you need to be vulnerable, the vulnerability to have the strength to walk around with no shirt on. And that's my man suit and be strong. But at the same time, to be vulnerable and say, hey, I made a mistake. Please forgive me. That's very, very difficult for men, especially for myself to do. I think to be authentic to them, to be truthful to them and to own up when you make a mistake. Hey, I made a mistake. How do I fix this? to be honest with them always, and to be forgiving. When they make a mistake, forgive them because they're young and, and they're learning and that's part of their journey. And I, I agree with everything else that you said. I'm there. curious for the two of you, when when you think, you, because Dennis, you're talking about your father being like this, and I'm talking about the two of you, how you feel as a father. Do you think that if you think more, don't talk as much, listen more, do you think that the kids will see you as weak? No, that's that's the key of being a leader, believe it or not. A no, leader. I'm talking, I know about I'm that, but that, 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 that'll, I'm talking about your girl. That'll translate into you being a leader of the household even better, even stronger, even so more. Because it? it's really hard <laughs> to do it. Because as a <laughs> as a parent, you're I'm I'm wondering if there's something more. No, different. seriously. It's like Dennis, as a parent. Let me let me answer real quick, Dennis, and then I'll uh, I'll let you jump <laughs> in. As as a father. Know? You're supposed to know all the answers. You're supposed to be the one telling them, especially when they're younger. Who told you your society. I don't know. It's something maybe internal in yourself. You feel uh, 
you you feel that the the sense of I need to be able to tell them because that's my job. I'm supposed to protect them. And but what if it is, isn't? Does it's not. Your it, it will change my thought. And I, I'm trying to get better. Yeah. I'm trying to work at it. Okay. So what are your thoughts, Dennis? Well, you know, I believe the question was, we think our children will think we're weak if we don't have the answer. I know I think they all think we're honest. And I think honesty is as strong as you can be. I don't mm -hmm. think you can be stronger than an honest man. Right. I mean, think about it. Why, why did we think that our, our grandparents, their generation, or even before them, were the best generation because they were perfect? No. Mm -hmm. It's because you could look a man in the eye, shake his hand, and that was your contract. That's right. That, that there was a certain level of dignity that just came from not knowing everything because we're in the information age and now we know everything. Mm -hmm. But it was the honesty of saying, I know or I don't know, or if, if I give you my word, you can pour concrete on it. And so it's honest to tell my child, I, I don't know the answer to that question, or I don't know what you should do. I'm going to think about it. Um, I think fatherhood, I had another thought as you were thinking about that, as you were asking that, how, when you asked how to be a better father. I think, and I'm just, these are just my own, your sort of birthing of the questions you, that you didn't ask. I think becoming a better father makes you not only a better man, uh, but I think it makes you a better husband. I think fatherhood, people may think that, you know, husbandry is like the beginning of, I think that when you're a great father, it reverses and makes you a greater husband. In my own personal life, I've been divorced for 11 years and it's, it's a wound that will not heal. And what I mean by that is, we, myself and my ex-wife, we love our children so much that, um, I mean, I fly all over the country to see them. I never miss any games. Well, you know, if I'm in California and my son's 5,000 miles away and he plays at eight o'clock, I, I fly all night. I'm there at eight o'clock in the stadium, not late. I've made a commitment to, to do that. I've made a commitment to them. And, but it, it hurts that my, that the marriage did not work, that my marriage did not work. And I think that if I had been a better father, I probably would have been a better husband. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the most, uh, and I know that sounds somewhat convoluted because it seems like maybe the sequence is off, mm -hmm. but one of the most painful things that I experienced in my life uh, was I was speaking to my, my son is 14 and my oldest is 22 and they're doing great in school, straight A students, my son's in graduate school, I just came back from visiting him. One of the things that pained me the most as a father is I remember when my son was about, I'm going to say maybe seven, six or seven, my 14 year old I'm speaking about. And he, they were with me for the weekend and he came into the house so excited. And I was so excited to see him excited. And he was like, daddy, daddy. And I was like, what is it? What is it? And he was standing beneath me there. His hands were about where my elbow, elbows are. And I sort of bent over a little bit. I said, what's going on? He said, I heard you used to live in our house. And man, that thing, I, that thing messed me up. He was so excited to learn that there was a time that father was in the home, he was excited over the idea of father yeah. being in the home. He wasn't sad that I was no longer there. He was fulfilled that I used to be. Mm. That is the importance of fatherhood. That even in our absence, in our in failed relationships, that even our previous presence still has a presence. Mm. And so when I look back at uh, my relationship, when I look at you know my participation in my boy's life, which is extreme. I mean, we li I literally speak to my boys four to five times every single day, um, that I still have that wound mm -hmm. of, of not being what I wish I would have been. And, um, you know, just trying to make the best of it as I can. Wow, what a beautiful story. I mean, really, I, that's when I always say that, that we learn so much from our little kids. 
we we can learn, you know, from their eyes, from their view, from their so simpleness. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we complicate life and sometimes we have to have the child view. I'm trying to wrap this this podcast up and you just shared the trigger story with me and the inspiration should be there for all of us fathers to do a better job. I mean, you've inspired me to look and say, don't take this relationship as it's just there, mm -hmm. um, really treasure it and really try to work to continue to work hard. And you give me a framework of what a, 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 a real father should do and, and what we should aspire to. So yeah, uh, I, I don't, well, yeah. I just want to say something to the two of you as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter, we need strong men. We need fathers to stand up and take their role if that makes sense, because it's lacking. And, and I, everyone talks down to, to the fathers in society nowadays. But me as a woman, as a wife, and as a mother, I'm asking everyone listening, Dennis, my husband, to be strong and fight for it because it's so worth it. And we want it. We need it. The kids need it. Society does as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing like a father. I mean, obviously, we talked about it earlier on. We need the, the protector. We need the gentleness. We need it all in the home, outside the home, as a grandfather, through the generations. Dennis, this, this show has been about fatherhood and all. But for those of you out there who want to get in touch with Dennis, can you share your, your website again? And and if you're anyone else out there looking to craft a story, we're, we talk about real estate. If you're looking to raise capital and, and get what we call a presentation going, or you just want to create a story and maybe write a book and leave that as a legacy for your children. I mean, there's so many different ways to utilize Dennis's skills. How can the listeners get a hold of you? Yes, thank you. You can find me on LinkedIn under my name, Dennis Ross. I'm the black guy with the beard. You can also send me, and I also have a cowboy hat a great, on there. It's a great beard, though. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I have a cowboy hat on there. I love horses. Uh, you can also send me an email at info, I-N-F-O, at bookambition.com, B-O-O-K-A-M-B-I-T-I-O-N. I mainly live on LinkedIn and live on email. And if you want to join our class that's happening starts December of this year, send me an email because the class is by invite only. So you won't be able to find a website for it. But if you send me an email and describe why you want to take the class, I can invite you to the class personally. And I also I'll leave my number because many people call me and I have conversations over the phone and I don't mind that. It is 678-468-3782. 678-468-3782. Be glad to speak to you about perfecting your story. And for those of you, Dennis doesn't just live on LinkedIn. He lives in the real world <laughs> and he speaks real truths and he speaks the reality and he will help you create the story. I just want to thank him for being on the show, sharing his story, his trigger story, sharing his inspiration. And any final words, Jewel? No, I think I said them. Uh, Dennis, do you have any final word for words for the listeners? I would just say thank you for having me on your program. And I think you all are great examples of parents and I hope millions and millions of people get a chance to watch you because we need to see examples like this uh, in media every single day. So I wish you nothing but success. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you so much. Take care, Thank everybody. You.